Hello, I'm Evan, the education program leader for the National Music Center. Usually you can find me in the galleries of Studio Bell, home of the National Music Center in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. But today I'm coming at you from the black curtain den of hip sounds. From day one, I've really been blown away by NMC's collection of electronic instruments and music technology, synths, recording studios, ooh la la. Today, we're going to use the National Music Center's Instrument Exploration Toolkit to look closely at one of these. My best guess is most of you have never seen one of these before. It's quite unusual and rare. To remind you how the National Music Center's Instrument Exploration Toolkit works, well, first we're going to look at how is this thing designed. Then I want to figure out what part of this makes a vibration and what kind of energy I have to put inside of it to make it vibrate. Once I'm making it vibrate, I want to control that vibration. I want to get different pitches and I want to get different volumes. Then we'll discuss the timbre, talk about how it sounds. Then we're going to look at how you make music with it. Let's start with the design. The bulk of the instrument is made out of wood. It's also pretty heavy for its size, so I think this is a pretty solid piece. The whole thing has a hand-carved look about it, like all of this is very intricate. Kind of looks like a giant soup spoon. There's bits of plastic. I have plastic knobs. There's screws. This looks like a brass plate. There's brass along here and another brass plate on the back. This whole stick section, which really reminds me of the neck of a guitar or a violin or a lute or any other number of instruments. The neck is divided up into these little squares, which seem to be painted on. Uh, there are 15 squares. One, two, three, 15. Three of them have this little diamond marking. There are some holes designed in the brass right here. It has a little hole here, which looks like I can plug a small wire into it, otherwise known as an auxiliary jack. There's a couple screws in the back of this brass plate. Battery. Big clue. Lifting out this battery, this hole looks hand carved. I can also see a circuit board back there with some solder marks. Big clues. There's a whole bunch of words on the front of this, including this big word, Sonica, which I think is the name of the instrument. This says by Frank Eventoff. All sorts of information. There are words above these three circles. This one says slider, this one says tone, and this one says half step. Right above this knob, it says key. Right above this one, it says off slash on dash vol. Sound Instruments, Los Angeles, California, and a patent number. We picked up all sorts of information by looking at how this instrument is designed. So now let's make it vibrate. We want to figure out what part of it vibrates and what kind of energy do we put into it to make it vibrate. It could be struck, pluck, air, or electric. Now struck feels a bit like cheating because almost any object in the world will make some sort of sound when you strike it or tap it, but I'm pretty sure that's not what this was designed to do. Also, if it was a plucked instrument, I'd have something to pull and let go, but doesn't seem right. What I look for in air instruments is something to pump and or blow into, and again, I'm coming up short. While looking at the design of this, I got all sorts of clues as to why this should be electronic. We had the battery, we had these knobs, we have a speaker. I want to take a few moments to talk about the speaker, easily one of the top five most interesting and important inventions of all time. These objects are so important and amazing that you may not have even considered that my voice is not coming from me right now. It's being generated by one of these. They come in many sizes and shapes. It is super simple in construction. This part is basically a cone made out of a very light material and it is fixed around the outside. The middle part is attached down here and you'll notice it has these two connectors. These wires are connected to copper wire, which is coiled around inside. So when you run electricity through this, it creates an electromagnetic field. And they often have a strong magnet back here. One thing you probably remember about magnets is you can create movement in objects by changing the magnetic field around it. You can either make it zoom away or make it want to pull towards you. Attract or repel. Let's put some electricity into this. So I've made a circuit right here. I have uh, some batteries connected together and these alligator clips are right by this. So when I touch the contact, the speaker pushes forward. 
Now, if I were to switch these around, the electricity would run it through it the other way, and it pulls it down. It's so simple. Run a positive charge through it, it moves one way. Run a negative charge through it, it moves the other way. So to create a vibration, we want our signal to move up and down and up and down and up and down. So all synthesizers have something in it called an oscillator. Well, an oscillation is a fancy word for something that moves back and forth, like a vibration. But I can control how fast it moves, and I can control how far it moves. This is the ultimate vibration-making machine, which is why I like it so much. Now, it shouldn't do anything when I just touch it here. This has an off-on ball knob, so let's try turning that. Makes a satisfying clicking sound. Wonderful. So now I want to control the pitch. What do you think I have to do? So I do get different notes by moving my fingers up and down the neck. So it gives you a diatonic scale rather than chromatic, meaning it's like the white keys on the piano rather than all of the white and black keys together. That allows me to play major scales and all the modes. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. That's why it's marked with the diamond, because these are all do. Ooh. So that's another way I can control the pitch, is this key knob. Almost theremin-like. This button called slider makes the pitch go up and down slide-wise instead of step-wise. This could help with techniques like vibrato, even just sliding between notes like some types of music. Cool, so this button that says half step raises the pitch by a half step, stepwise, unlike the slider. So this instrument actually offers quite a few options to control the pitch like a musical instrument. What about the volume? This is quite simple on this instrument. It's our old friend, the knob that says off on vol. Vol stands for volume. This knob has a bit of a grungy sound. Musician Tex would say I have a dirty pot because this electronic part is actually called a potentiometer. It's nice that the volume knob's right here. So you can get a little bit of swell dynamics as you play. We looked at how it's designed. We are controlling the vibration with the pitch and the volume. How would you describe the sound of this instrument? It's hard to deny that all electronic instruments have a kind of unique timbre. Electric-y, electronic-ish. Sounds very close to a triangle wave, but we'll get into waveforms another time. Other words could be bright, mechanical, video gamey, synthish. It sounds electronic. This tone key should actually change the timbre a little bit. But this one doesn't seem to be working. This instrument is designed fairly nicely to help a musician make music on it. It's approachable for players of almost any skill. Before I've practiced at all, you can play notes at supersonic speeds. Anybody can have fun with that right away. It would also be very easy to play simple melodies on this quickly. I've heard a rumor that this was meant to replace recorders in the classroom. One a penny, two a penny, hot cross. It could have worked, but it still would have been hard to tune everybody together with this thing. This instrument is what we call monophonic because it can only play one note at a time. Mono, one, phonic, sound. Phonos, song. So if I try to play two notes, it just switches between the two. But when you're playing it, that can be a very cool effect. One limitation of this is that it is rather weak. I mean, I have a nine volt driving a tiny little speaker, but I do have this auxiliary jack. That means I can carry the signal forward to whatever speaker I want.
or if I want to get really fancy, I can plug it into some kind of an effects processor or a guitar pedal, and that will play with the electrical signal. Oh, yeah. The Sonica was built back in 1979 by Frank Eventoff. Frank Eventoff also invented a toy called the Magical Musical Thing released by Mattel around the same time. The Magical Musical Thing did sell thousands of units, whereas this was uh, financially not successful. There was only about 650 of these ever made. Even though this instrument is so rare, the National Music Center has over 30 of them. They were all donated by a fellow named Ralph Grierson, a highly successful session musician who's played on many movie soundtracks. I think Ralph owned stock in Sound Instruments, and when the company did not succeed, he was paid in Sonicas. It's really worked out for us because this is an excellent instrument to put in front of a visiting student. Now, I know you probably don't have one of these in your house, but you probably do have an electronic instrument of some kind. If not an instrument proper, you probably have a device that can make sound. I will give you some links to some fun electronic instruments you can find online. Play around with them. And remember, all the sounds you are hearing are being generated by this wonderful invention. So have fun. And until next time, happy exploring. Thanks for watching. Please like, share, and or subscribe. Also, the National Music Center is a charity that relies on donations, so if you have the means and feel like it, please go to studiobell.ca slash donate.